uh, committee of the whole meeting. We, as you know, all the service teams, the committee of the holes, uh, come together on roughly a quarterly basis. It, Go a little deeper dive into some of the work that they're doing. So I am going to turn it right over to Joanna to tee this up. And we've got Carrie in line with us to share some of the work that's going on. Joanna. Thank you, Commissioner. I just want to uh, just briefly say that we're going to be focusing here uh, today on a theme of collaboration across the EGCI service team, focusing on three departments, Workforce Solutions, uh, Community and Economic Development, and Housing Stability. With that, I'm going to turn it over to the teams. We're going to have folks kind of popping up to the table and stepping back um, as we move through the agenda, and we will uh, uh, move right into the topics, and I'll turn it over to Lane. And before we do that, we could make more room so people don't need to. Why don't we do that? Yeah, Keith, uh, yeah we can. You guys are a part of this. Let's get you up here. Okay, it's a big table. <laughs> we all got masks on. We're demonstrating how we make room at the table for everyone. <laughs> this is the collaboration and working together right here. All right. Go ahead, Joanna. Who are you going to kick this off to? I'm going to start with Lingus, please. Thank you for coming up. I think Carrie, you want to show sure. us something that yeah. already is. <laughs> this is going to be a choreographed dance. So, um, thank you so much. This is a, an awesome opportunity just to kind of take a moment to breathe and to kind of acknowledge the degree of integration, alignment, and collaboration across the department. Um, so, thank you for this opportunity. Um, first, we'll talk uh, about Ramsey County Needs Business as an opportunity for community and economic development in particular and workforce solutions to align uh, both in terms of kind of the business development side of things and then businesses as employers in the workforce side. And so uh, Ling in a moment will talk about kind of the maximizing that she has done through the workforce side of the Ramsey County Needs Business Platform. But as a reminder, uh, the website did launch initially as an opportunity to attract business to our region to create opportunities for land availability or, or better clarity around what's available in terms of land and incentive resources. And then within just a few months, that quickly changed to the COVID-19 recovery dashboard and assisting our small businesses through obviously one of the most difficult times of all of our lives. And so uh, we had the opportunity to create a recovery dashboard then that aligned all of the kind of incentives at the federal, state, and local level, which became a lifeline to many small businesses, as well as promote the small business relief rounds on the site as well. With that said, we all understand the complexities and the challenges and the crises around the workforce side of things that we're still enduring as well. And so Ling found an opportunity to maximize the site. And so she has quite an array of, of items that you can go through. Yeah, and I'm really excited to be able to showcase um, some of the website to you. I hope maybe you can either see it up at that um, last screen, or I know we don't have a big screen to be able to show it to you today. But um, really, I think um, because this was a site that was focused on business attraction, we're really recognizing that people are a critical part of the assets of why a business would want to locate in Ramsey County. And to make those investments in people is really a, a, an important part of our economic development strategy. And so... I'm going to go out to the site and just show you um, some of the enhancements that we have made. Um, hopefully you can see it um, in some way. Let's make this a little bit bigger here. Um, You're on the Ramsey County Means business. I am. Okay. Um, I am. Um, it might be, yeah, if you want to navigate it yourself, you could, I could kind of talk us through it as well. Um, so if you click on the workforce link up at the top button, that just drives you to the kind of the workforce portal. And what you'll see um, is a series of, um, I think it's up there too if you need to see it on that really small screen, but um, there's a series of buttons of different um, elements that we are now providing to folks to use the website. We had the Job Connect job board, which has been very well used. I'm not going to show you that today because we've already shown you that in 2019, but that has ability for businesses to post for free for jobs, job seekers to look for jobs. They can go in and um, see it uh, geographically, which is very unique. Um, there's ability to search by transit. 
What I'd like to highlight is some other new features that we've added. So if you click on Workforce Training Dashboard, um, we've basically compiled all the free trainings that are offered within Ramsey County, and you can search it by industry. So there are currently 81 different training programs that residents can find more information about. So whether it's you know child development or manufacturing or you know brick laying, I mean there's it's, it's all kind of um, in one spot. And and really this really speaks well to understanding our role as the workforce provider in the county. Um, being somebody who really helps the whole ecosystem sort of glue together, which is really a critical role for the county. So that's, there's the workforce training dashboard. That's one thing I wanted to show you. The other, um, if you go back and go back to that main menu, the other thing I wanted to show you is this workforce partners uh, page. So if you click on that, this was a, a lot of work. Um, we have a very robust workforce ecosystem in Ramsey County. Now on this site, you will be able to see that we have all the workforce partners in Ramsey County organized um, by different categories. So there's probably like 200 different workforce partners here. Um, so I'll give you an example. There's other things like arts, chambers and collaboratives, culturally specific services, disability, education and training. If you click on culturally specific services, you'll see like all the different um, providers of um, workforce services that focus on different um, ethnic and race populations. Um, I'll give, just give you walk you through one example. If you want to click on Andai Young, there, the second um, box or second row down, you'll be able to see that you know on these pages we can show people how to contact those organizations. We've been working in partnership with all these organizations to figure out what they would like to showcase on these organizations. And from a business attraction and retention yeah. perspective, yeah. we know that businesses want to understand the ecosystem and what what is that pipeline for potential talent and who's in the who's here to support them and so can i pause yeah. there too because this 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 really shows um to just okay. further refine that point the business attraction piece prior to COVID 19 when we were responding to a request for information from prospective businesses many of the times cities would go to our site and they would download there's a report feature on there that allows them to download quick workforce demographics, which is always near the top of what a business was requesting pre-pandemic. Now, as you can imagine, as a business is looking to relocate to a various region, to see this workforce infrastructure on this site, on this business-centric site, shows that they are going to be kind of nurtured within our local economy, positioning ourselves to be more economically competitive. And so mm -hmm. um, it really is a unique opportunity that shows the wonderful you know, opportunities to align. Yeah, so I appreciate that, Carrie. And so you can, you know, if you scroll through that partners page, there's things like the Midway area, there's support services, there's leadership development, East Side. So we'll continue to build that out, but um, we plan to actually host a couple of uh, virtual open houses for community organizations to learn how to just navigate the site. Because again, I think it's really important to recognize our role in the county is to support the other partners in the ecosystem. And so, um, so the next place I'm going to take you is. Um, the labor market reports or labor market information. So if you get back to that workforce main page and click on labor market information, um, again, we're trying to help our, um, our our workforce partners, for example, apply for grants. And so by us being the ones that produce reports and information about what's happening in our community is really, really helpful. So um, I won't tell you to go there now, but we have COVID reports that you can go through. Those are by neighborhood. But if you click on industry reports, um, and scroll down there, we have a variety of industry reports that our partners and any public person is you know, able to use. So if you click on construction, for example, you're going to find monthly data on wages, on what's being advertised, on who are the top employers. You can download those reports and use them. And so these are, you know, again, as Carrie was saying, I, you know, I really do believe that too, that businesses are going to find these to be super critical tools. Um, if you go back, um, we also have some other reports that I think, um, I know Commissioner Fratham, you're familiar with our workforce child care report that's on there, but we just released a green, green uh, construction report this month. We have a report on the IT challenges and the tech challenges. I know Ms. Commissioner McDonough, you've been following that, and we have a youth report. Um, it might seem like, you know, these sound like just, you know, why all these reports, but this is a really important part to supporting our smaller nonprofits as they uh, try to advocate for more money so that they can pinpoint what the needs are and to have somebody like the county to cite in, in some of their requests for funding. So. Mm -hmm. 
official mask is sealed. When you say we in these reports, yeah. who, who's making these oh, reports? Yeah. They're pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, so we, um, it's between our, our department and then we partner with a, a Real Time Talent, which is an organization in the metro that does that. So we, we're, we're pretty hands on. Awesome, thank you. Yep. And then, Link, before you move on, yeah. I just wanted to point out I mean, we just did this last week at the web executive. Work around the green construction shop. There was mm -hmm. folks meeting. There was you got the report, mm -hmm. but it's actually elevated to the point where now it's become in a committee of the web to actually help bring even more power and influence behind this and, and collaborate. So this is working in real time. Mm -hmm. um, this work in the effort that um, is going on here. Yeah, you'll hear a lot more from us about green construction. Um, we believe that that could be one of the highest growth areas of construction, mm -hmm. especially with additional federal resources that will be um, coming out. And that's where another intersection for Carrie and I is that there's a lot of entrepreneurial opportunity around green, green construction. And um, actually, on September 24th, we're going to be hosting a, a green bus tour um, uh, over on the east side. And so. There's just a, a lot of projects that have a green focus and more funding coming through the area. So we want to be ready to leverage some of that. And then the other thing that this helps us do is to continue to work with those smaller nonprofits and encourage them to apply for Cure Pathways um, funding in some of these high growth industries. So, so if you go back to again to the main um, get that through board. Ramsey County or no? Do I have to go in separately? It's Ramsey County um, Use business, business. Right here. within okay. Ramsey County. No, oh, no. Oh, oh, I can't get in through Ramsey no. County. No wonder I can't okay. find it. Google. I am like Ramsey so County. to tell somebody to go into Ramsey County doesn't help. No. There should be a link. I would. Say. There probably is a link, but we it's just a short way to get okay. it through Ramsey. County. All right. So yeah. all right. Okay. okay. So if you're back on the main page with all those workforce options, if you go down to the bottom, um, I want to show you two more quick things. One is the school path, uh, school district care pathway. So it's the very last one on the left hand side. If you click on that, we've worked really hard with our school districts. Um, we're missing um, North St. Paul and Maplewood because they're in the process of finishing their a new website. But if you click on Mounds View, you will see that we've now um, built out career pathway information for all our high schools um, where a business who wants to engage with career pathways in a high school knows which industries that school has career pathways in. They know, they kind of can read about some of the partnerships that have they've had and know contact information, how they can participate. We've heard again and again from businesses that, you, you know, you call a phone number and you don't know who to get in touch with. You don't understand how to interact with maybe the school. And we're also doing the same thing with our uh, Minnesota State partners. And we've been in conversation to build that part out and that's not done yet, but that's another piece is adding our school districts into this web page. Again, with the mi mindset that businesses actually care a lot about what's happening in our school district. Well, and I'll just add too that businesses looking to relocate are often, uh, if they're receiving any ounce of kind of local subsidy, oftentimes what will be written into that business subsidy policy is an expectation of partnership with the school district to build out a career pathway program. I've seen that done a few times. And so this kind of, again, streamlines what could be that future partnership and then also makes them score better. For example, if they're going for job creation funds through DEED, mm -hmm. it makes them be able to score better because they, we've kind of equipped mm -hmm. them with that kind of ready-to-go partnership. So, Mr. Chair, can I just, one second. So, Director Becker and Director Collins, I just mentioned you in my in my county connections this morning because this is who, who I heard from, Mongeo and Roseville, who loves this. This career pathways program. So thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. Yeah, I mean it's a really again. I think um, in the last couple of years while I've been here, we've really been trying to figure out where the gaps are in the workforce ecosystem and what in critical role the county can play. And it is this really important like convening, leveraging resources, filling gaps, kind of being the kind of the the one that gathers all these folks. Like so, one example I'll give you really tangibly that happened this week around our community partners was. Comcast has a new program, and I know Commissioner McDonough, you're familiar now too, Lift Zones, where they're willing to work with nonprofits to create kind of super Wi-Fi mm -hmm. hotspots in some of those locations. Well, they didn't know how to connect with all the community-based partners, but we could convene those webinars and host those meetings and really bring those folks together. So again, putting the county kind of in that leadership role of, of convening has been a, a really appreciated thing by the community, I feel. Then I'll show you one last thing because this is very, um, this is brand new. A press release just went out today on it. Um, it's Hospitality Future Finder. So if you can go back to your workforce main page, 
um, it's, it's up to the last one on the right hand side of the column. Hospitality Future Finder. We know that our restaurants and hotels and uh, retail businesses mm -hmm. are having a very hard time uh, finding people. And so we're partnering with Visit St. Paul and Visit Roseville, and we've created basically a one stop shop for businesses to post jobs and to kind of do a social media campaign around the relevance and importance of these jobs mm -hmm. for our community. Um, and also where the, there's training available. Um, they're really taking the lead on it, the, those two visitors associations, and we've also um, reached out to all our cities and other chambers to help support it as well. But we've leveraged our job board. Again, Where what assets can we bring to the table? We have the job board. Mm -hmm. We're able to then put all those jobs in one spot. It's one click for employers and for job seekers. And the other thing we found out from those employers is they sometimes have not had the HR expertise to know how to post jobs. So if you click on that link that says no stress hospitality, it's kind of in the in the written part of the um, second portion of that website. That is a new site that's been built to help um, restaurant owners basically fill out job application, uh, job descriptions, because if these are templates for line cooks, sous chefs, servers, mm -hmm. so that they can use, because they're using like Craigslist, they're yeah. using you know, Facebook, but they, they are not typical like Indeed posters or using job boards. And they said, we don't have time to attend job fairs. I know we're going to continue to do more either virtual or in-person job fairs, but when we heard from the hospitality and retail industry, they said, we need something else. We, we, we want help, but the, we can't have the same kind of help that you're giving other businesses because we don't have people that can stand at a table for four hours at a time. We're all working in our, our, our industries. And so... Um, so hopefully that gives you a little flavor of the depth and breadth that we've really tried to build out this site to be something that um, can support our business community. Yeah. All right, like you breathe, Trista's got to. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard to breathe. It is. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and you talk really fast. Yeah. So uh, two, two questions. One is um, great job. First of all, yeah. great job. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. What the website's a year and a half, two years old. I don't know time with the pandemic, but. Yep. It's really great. You've done a really great job. My question is, how do employers know that this resource is available? And two, do we have data on how many employers are using the website? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we. So if you go to the very main part of the workforce page, well, you'll see that our partners are um, the cities and the chambers. And so they all have now put this on their page as um, kind of, like nobody else wanted a job board anymore because it's really hard to maintain. So the county right. taken that responsibility mm. to be that, um, that take that role. Um, Carrie could probably speak more to the, the hits that the yeah. site gets. Um, I know you yeah. get more regular reports. Yeah, we, we, we get quarterly analy analytics, both um, from internal communications, but then also from Golden Shovel, who are tracking it on too. I think last year, Small Business Relief was the name of the game, and so I think there was something like 70,000 hits wow. across the various rounds. And you can see when they show you the Google Analytics, obviously, when you promote something around or, you you know, then you see the spikes in the page views and the unique page views. So we track it there. But I will say in terms of the kind of uh, coalition or coordination of support, especially last year, we talked as an East team and that, you know, I think, you know, all the economic development players around that table, you know, everybody like felt compelled to be that resource navigator and they thought our site was best equipped to play that role. And so the city of St. Paul and the St. Paul area chamber and visit St. Paul and the downtown Alliance and the Port Authority all drove traffic to our site. Um, and we, you know, had dedicated um, support in Rick Howden as the economic development specialist to kind of keep it up to date, you know, real time uh, because information was coming out so fast and it, it continues to come out really fast. Uh, so we have some additional communication support helping us through this next year, but we keep track of those Google Analytics to see what people are paying attention to because it's very informative to see, you know, is it more, you know, capital lending? Is it more workforce, job connect? Where are, where is the energy going um, to get a pulse of, of what the business community might be experiencing? Okay, Mary Jo, do you have a question? Um, just um, thanks, thanks, thanks. You know, this is great. McGough Construction loves you also because they're on the web board and they hosted our Twin Cities business or our business council for Roseville. Um, this actually maybe I should wait on it. It just came to my mind, but this is the kind of 
website that I'm, uh, social services is looking for, you know, a compilation of where to go for, for food and, and, and you know, uh, other things, you know, that there's a resource list that we're trying to do at the collaborative, at the Suburban Family Collaborative, but we want a resource list for where to go for other things, too. So just putting that in people's minds that this is a great thing to do, but I'm hoping we can do this in other areas of our county. Thanks. Okay. First of all, this is so exciting, and it's marvelous to see the site up and usable in this way. You pointed us to Hospitality Futures Finders, and that's wonderful uh, to see the jobs there posted, some with signing bonuses, et cetera, um, lack of, of education beyond high school required, and at Wonderful. I go back and I see that under Job Connect, you've got all the industries listed. So I'm assuming that at some point you're going to be able to go in here and use this with partners who are listing jobs in a number of industries. Is that correct? And I'm not doing that now. When I click on administrator, for example, nothing comes up right now. Can you just fill yeah, it might be in. that there's no jobs commissioner mm -hmm. under, and under administrative, but there um, there's many categories in there, and we can definitely kind of pull mm -hmm. a search so that it's one click for people. Okay. We've done that so far for that hospitality Got industry, it. and we've done it for construction because we really want to encourage people who are doing construction projects with mm -hmm. their okay. to post there. So those are the two industries that we've created kind of individual pages for so you'll see there's a page also for construction as well right okay so, so and and i'm i'm just appreciating this mm -hmm. first and foremost mm -hmm. i am also on my cell phone so that could be a reason why i'm not getting mm -hmm. up those various categories but i'm not getting in from that job connect page even to construction oh okay. and so you know it, it could be me but i just want to make sure that you know that this is exciting and wonderful and i look forward to its evolution. Great. Thank you. I'm going to move us along because we've got a lot. Leg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to stop sharing here and we'll go back. Just Now you guys can just go back to your um, handouts if that's just easier for you. Um, kind of switching topics slightly, but still um, partnership between Carrie and I um, is really, um, you know, the economic competitiveness and inclusion plan is something that both of us and our departments are very committed to executing against. And this is just one step of that in partnership with the Workforce Innovation Board. And so um, outlined in the vision plan, there were a couple of strategies around um, supporting employers by incentivizing hiring by zip codes, talking about um, equipping employers to uh, dismantle racism and to work on more inclusive and equitable hiring. And so we took these ideas back to our workforce board, which um, just as a refresher, 51% of that 33 member board are made up by business members and said to them, you know, what, what kinds of things would be helpful for businesses? And we started by looking at some models around the state and there were some um, ideas around, you know, giving people a designation, like kind of, you know, jump, you know, kind of checking off a few things and saying, well, we're an inclusive employer. We have a sticker on our door, something like that. Our, our board decided that they wanted to do something deeper and more meaningful, being the most diverse county in the state and, and recognizing the work that this board is committed to. So um, our first attempt at, at, at kind of influencing this area is what's, gonna, what's called the Inclusive Workplaces Program. And so it's really um, a, an opportunity for businesses not to just um, attend a, a, a workshop not um, send a few people to a training, not bring in a, a speaker to their um, place of work, but to really think about how they could do, start the hard work of being a more inclusive workplace. And so we've shared this widely. Um, the deadline, and I'll talk about that in a moment, is at the end of this week, and we've held several info sessions already this month and last month. But it's really a, a fostering a peer learning environment for businesses that want to dig in on these topics on how to be a more diverse and equitable employer. And so I'm um, in partnership with the Center for Economic Inclusion. They're going to be going through a 10 month experience and we've asked them to um, put in two leaders who are going to make decision, who have decision making power um, to participate in this program. There is no cost to businesses, but as we've explained in the workshop to them, there is a cost because they have to decide that they want to make change. They have to dig in and really do the hard work. 
They have to prioritize. They have to put leadership attention on this. And so um, to be eligible, a business has to have presence in Ramsey County. They need to, again, designate two people who have decision-making um, power, commit to attending all 10 sessions. With um, And this came from our business community, but they wanted them to do a final project. Not so much like school to final project, but you know, how has this given you as a business a return on investment? Did you change a policy? Did you incorporate, create something new as a part of your workplace culture? Did you, um, you know, change something in your hiring process? So they're going to be expected to pick something to really dig in on and work through that. Um, it's a safe and brave place to have conversations. We told the employers that this is a, it's not about where you are, but where you want to be and where you want to go. And and, and it, it, it doesn't sound as flashy as kind of being able just to stand up and say, we, we did it quickly, but this is just really about that hard work of changing culture. And we see that even in our own, you know, as an employer having to change, do that hard work within HR and within our department to diversify. So um, we're really excited about this. Um, we're um, working with up to 20 businesses. We're giving preference to those that are 100 or fewer, um, really because we recognize the expense and the um, Bandwidth sometimes is really limited for smaller businesses to do this. It's open to you know all of Ramsey County, and we're really excited about launching this. So um, the, next, the the following slide that has um, the the graphic just demonstrates some of the learning principles that they're going to go through as a part of the cohort. Um, and so I'm happy to answer anything about that. And then um, the deadline is um, Friday. Uh, notification is the 19th of August, and the first session will begin in October. Well, one thing I'll just add is that the Center for Economic Inclusion has done a really great job of pushing the private sector to do more than just issue an organizational value statement. Mm -hmm. And so this is an actual an actual opportunity to put that organizational you know mission or value statement into work for many organizations. And so I could see this opportunity scaling up moving forward. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make one quick comment before we move on. I think that actually demonstrates the strength of you got the Center for Economic Inclusion really push a business to do more than just talk, right? Walk it. We're, we're bringing in government and WIB as kind of that facilitator to help make that transition to doing better. And then we've got businesses actually stepping up to mm -hmm. come through a program. And I mean, it's there, but it's it's really a neat opportunity to talk about, you know, we talk about what we own, you know, when we convene, when we partner. And this is a really good example of partnering and convening to actually making a difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good work. Yeah. Victoria. So all of this, I mean, it, you work with the, the chambers and the business organizations. I know there's a couple that are just associations. Mm -hmm. And so they have all of this information so that are you getting a good response? I mean, I know the applications aren't due until Friday, but. Yeah, we've had probably, I would say, 15 or so at every um, uh, info session that okay. we've had. We've had three or four. Um, and I believe we had a couple applicants, at least at least one applicant from the White Bear Lake area. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Going. <clears throat> okay. Um, switching topics, I'm going to be talking about something called CERT Connect. And this is, um, it, it involves Carrie's department, but also, you know, brings in a few of our other um, EGCI um, areas of property management, parks, and public works. But um, as you all know, um, our service team has really been working to try to increase our CERT spend, especially around um, construction. And um, CERT Connect is an innovative idea that came out of our um, uh, procurement contracting and action, uh, um, action team, which is a service team structure to help us kind of uh, improve those outcomes around contracting. And um, it was a COVID pivot. We realized that there weren't as many networking opportunities to meet with small businesses. And so um, the group that was a part of our PCAT decided that, you know, there's something we can still do here, even during COVID. And so... Um, we partnered actually with also um, um, Tax for the Land um, as well in the assessor's office with um, IPR. And the goal was to continue to move this work forward and connect with um, CERT vendors. And so um, we created a leadership team of folks from property management, um, Nick Fahey, uh, Parks and Rec, Scott Yonke, um, from uh, uh, IPR with Michael Wolf, Public Works, Luke Lowry, and then from my department, John O'Fallon. 
And what they've been doing is basically um, creating 30-minute discussions with business owners via Zoom. And we are just really surprised at how well it is going. And it, it, it is something that I could see that post-COVID we will continue to do because it's a chance for the owners to get in a room with people who are buying their products and really be able to ask a lot of questions and get to know a little bit about the county. People aren't just names on paper, but they become you know, faces and, and you can um, ask for more information. And we've had up to 50 staff attend these um, sessions from all different departments. Um, so what happens is on Monday, um, John from our staff will send out the information about the company. We've already have all the like concert connect on people's calendars. So you see the company previewed on Monday. Then on Thursday, you log in and there's the business owner and they get a few minutes to talk a little bit about themselves. These are all cert certified businesses already who have been underutilized. So we've kind of picked a, a very niche group who um, sell things that these departments have bought or will continue to buy. And um, we're really excited that, you know, since just doing this program, we've had about eight to 10 uh, connect ups. We've had one company get a contract already since that time. And, I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but it is a it's a path forward to really building relationships with with these companies. And um, Terry had a recent um, economic development summit with the cities, and so I came and presented um, this this project. And we've now are offering for the Ramsey County cities to attend some of these uh, connects as well because they buy fencing and you know different things that we 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 have in these areas. And so um, or you know. So anyway, these are some of the businesses that we've um, uh, featured in the last um, few months. Um, you'll see a list of them there. Communications has built us an internal web page where we can keep all the information of the businesses that we've met with. We have a record. We're going to start recording all the Zoom. So we, you know, even if you weren't in the business last month of buying from that company, maybe in two or three months you will, and now you can go back and put a name with a face and reconnect with that company. And so we heard a lot of positives from the companies themselves. As you can see on the slide, it says, you know, they really appreciated department members who were willing to take time to listen. People felt really like they were kind of the center of attention where they were the only vendor in the room and we got to introduce ourselves and they got to tell us about that. And so um, I just wanted a chance to, you know, tell you about that work that our PCAT has been very busy doing and it's really been a, a, a you know, full service team collaboration. And I'll be happy to say that we shared this as a best practice to the other uh, um, PCAS in the county, and now IPR is doing their own set of CERT Connects as well. Wow. One quick question from me, Lane. Yeah. You mentioned underutilized. Yeah. They're already CERT. Yeah. Um, do we have a sense, are they underutilized because they haven't been successful in past attempts to get contracts, or have they just been you know, certified as a CERT, but then just chose not to even participate. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure the full definition, but I do know that they have, they were ones that we had not contacted within the last year. We don't know if it's because they're right. not successful or they just haven't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Tony. I just wanted to ask a question that you may have answered and I did here, but how do these businesses come forward? How are they selected to present? Yeah, so um, the team goes through and um, looks at kind of the things that they have coming up that they need to purchase mm -hmm. in, the, in the coming, you know, months. And then they look at that um, underutilized list of certain certified businesses that we haven't used in the last so many months, and then they try to find those connections. So they collaboratively determine mm -hmm. kind of what areas have the most potential return on somebody's investment okay. and that time with us, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. so. It does. Thank you. All right, continue. Okay, yep. well, I have one last thing, um, and that's with on the other side of the table. Um, we've been <laughs> collaborating, <laughs> collaborating with our new housing stability office, and um, I am just so grateful that um, Keith's department is in our service team. Um, we've just found lots of ways where there's intersection, and I know we haven't even started to even really unearth all the potential, but um, as many of you know, in 2019, you know, the um, continuum of care did some reorganizing, reshifting. Um, it was opportune time that I was able to then put my name in the ring to join the governing board, which I was successful at attaining a seat, which um, I feel is a really important part of the work of the continuum of care 
there's a lot of opportunities there that we can take advantage of to ensure that we have really strong connections. Um, I oftentimes even get emails from our funders to the Department of Labor asking how we are working together with our HUD funded programs. And so these are things that ultimately should get us more funding in the future as we build out those partnerships. Um, and one of the strategies of the um, continuum of care is intentionality around connecting workforce services to those who are experiencing homelessness. And um, I, I don't know if previously there was um, as strong of a connection to make a difference in that area, but I feel like um, there certainly is now. And so um, while we could look at the whole spectrum of people who are experiencing homelessness, um, with, and we will, and, and we continue to um, begin to start to do that, I felt there needed to be some more additional intentionality around our youth and young adults, um, primarily because of the COVID impact that they have experienced. And so um, the first opportunity out of the gate with the COC and also with Housing Stability and Workforce Solutions collaboration has been uh, my leading a young adult um, and youth employment work group um, of people who really support young people in this area. And I will say that the first couple meetings, it was quite amazing that folks kind of knew of each other, but there had never been a table where they really focused on a conversation about work and employment. And they were really grateful to be able to do that. And so we spent probably, you know, two or three meetings really trying to just understand where um, there were opportunities and where there were missed kind of alignments and where there were gaps. Um, they, they all experienced a lot of the same thing, trying to connect into services. And there's just a lot of, you know, not quite exact matches that are out there. And so my goal, again, back to the work that I've been doing with Carrie, is to sort of reset and think about what is the county's right role in supporting that. I mean, a lot of them even said, we don't necessarily need more funding. We just need more glue. Like, we need to understand how... <laughs> you will uplift this ecosystem and support us. And we talked a lot about, we had a couple of working sessions on what do you do that you uniquely have to do? And what are there things that you do that you don't actually think you should be doing or want to do, but somebody else is doing or the county is doing, but we're not all doing it like kind of in alignment. And so we've been just doing a lot of that mapping right now. Um, so over time, I really do hope that in the youth and young adult space, we can um, make some big strides for our community by just um, uh, having conversations that just really haven't been being had. So, all right. yeah, and then um, just very last slide is just really around all the different um, opportunities around housing that I foresee and I'll let's speak, keep speaking to that too, but um, aligning just our workforce funding um, to People who are experiencing homelessness, we actually have priority funding um, in our federal program for youth. We have waivers that allow us to serve homeless youth, and I'm not sure those linkages have been as strong as they could be. And so here's an opportunity to do that. Um, we've been working with social services. I'm really excited about this. Foster care, I mean, everybody knows that foster care youth and those um, aging out have um, significant homeless um, rates. And, and there's a real opportunity to do workforce work with this population. And um, the legislature has made significant investments around um, providing them college education. And to me, that just says we better do our job to get them ready for college education because now there's a whole new other set of resources that they have a chance to obtain. You know, so I'd love to see that that rate of young people who take advantage of that legislative opportunity is very high in Ramsey County. And it's not because well, we, we got to the point where we were college age, but we weren't able to take advantage of that because for whatever reason, you know, we fell through the gap. Um, I think the housing providers are not as versed in the workforce programs and services as they could be. So I hope to propose um, to the Continuum of Care and to Keith's team that once a year, Workforce Solutions will host a convening of sorts, whether it's in person or virtual, to really just make sure everybody understands what are all those services that you can connect into and um, plug into. Um, obviously, Keith and I've talked about promoting all our trainings and job fairs to people in the in the different facilities and in his um, in his area. Um, there's obvious, there's lots of future grant opportunities. I think once we kind of get on a more of a, a cadence of, of of working together more. 
And um, certainly you all have seen, we have a strong interest in our department of uh, engaging youth. And there's a real opportunity around um, making sure there's youth voice when it comes to building out some of these ideas and programs that will help us actually leverage funding. And so some sort of youth advisory board for the COC, I could see myself and our department having a, a strong role in as well. So I think I don't know if you have anything to add there. No, actually, I think you covered. Oh, all right, so I'm gonna step aside here. Next right. combination of departments. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, <laughs> um, I'm actually going to jump ahead. If you're following on your screen, I'm going to jump ahead to um, the supply and demand slide. And so if you have that, because I'm going to allow Max to introduce um, two or, or three new housing division hires who are in the room with us today. Um, but what I'll, I'll just start off by saying is that I think community and economic development, certainly in housing disability, are just starting to get our, our, our wheels in motion in terms of alignment coordination, um, certainly an opportunity there. I think uh, for both internal and external clarity, we wanted to provide this graphic to show you know, the housing stability side in, in that there's the demand, and then the community and economic development side in terms of the supply. And you could probably mirror a comparable graphic for the, the work that Ling and I do as well. Um, and so you'll see kind of in the light teal, you know, Keith will talk about kind of the demand side of things, and here we're talking about the housing supply. And where we intersect is that permanent supportive housing. And that's at that 30% AMI that we talk so frequently about, and that was certainly embedded as a major tenet within the economic competitiveness and inclusion plan. Um, talking about the ECI plan, one of the biggest pieces that our consultants uh, you know, reviewed, they said, you want to be more of a critical partner, you need to build capacity. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking back to um, a new hire, Carrie Collins, coming into the okay. county. and. Um, Somebody scheduled one on one meetings with all of the commissioners, and I met with Commissioner McDonough. And I remember one of the things we said, Commissioner McDonough, was, I suppose you want to deepen your bitch. <laughs> jump ahead how many years later. And we are here um, building out that bench so that we can make more uh, of a critical difference within our economy. I think you certainly know the data that was reported as part of the vision plan showing that we are you know, 15,000 units behind meeting the needs of our existing community. We've got a lot of work to do, and we've got a huge opportunity through federal re relief resources. And now uh, with the HRA levy to build up programming to start to make a dent in some of that critical housing infrastructure. Um, so uh, I think it was late February or so, uh, we had this awesome opportunity to uh, snag Max Hold Houston here. And so I want to reacquaint you with Max <laughs> in his new capacity uh, as manager of housing policy and development. He is leading our housing development division. And uh, with that, I will go back to the original slide to can talk I, about can, the- yeah. Can I just jump in real quick? Yeah. And I, you know, I'm going to be looking to you folks too, but one of the biggest things I hear as we continue to have this conversation about this gap, right, in affordable housing. And we know the biggest gap is at 30%, but we always view 30% for the most part as supportive housing. And I continue to hear really the bigger part of that gap at 30% is just the affordability at 30%, not necessarily the need for supports other than that affordability. And I see everybody shaking their head. And I just want to make sure we're starting to look at that gap in that way that that 30% is not just a supportive housing exclusively. And actually, the bigger part of that gap may be just the affordability at that level and not necessarily the supports that we tend to associate with that level. Uh, Commissioner McDonough, you're absolutely right. And so when we look at that 15,000 unit deficit, that does not mean or translate to 15,000 permanent supportive housing units. Um, that certainly translates to um, that level of affordability for those that may be on the cusp of experiencing housing instability to be able to afford the rent. And so, you know, I think it's, it's both and. It's, we certainly right. need the, uh, permanent supportive housing, but we also need that first you know, that rental unit that, that our community can afford. Yep. Tristan. Yeah, uh, on that note, thank you for bringing that up because I have this conversations a lot with community. Um, do we have any sense of what those numbers balance out to of the 15,000? Like how many of that is supportive and how, how many is affordability? We saw uh, Minneapolis just moved to, you know, uh, 
uh, boarding houses again, which I know Max and I, we've talked about it a lot. We have opportunities for that here in St. Paul and in Ramsey County. What's, what's the need? Do we know what that breakdown is? That, I don't know if you've done, we, we can certainly look at the data, go back to the data and kind of disaggregate that mm -hmm. out because I think that that would be particularly compelling as well. I don't have that offhand. No, I don't yeah. think there's a way to take apart that 15,000 and figure out within that which services people need within that. It's more, I think, looking at um, institutional gaps mm -hmm. and thinking about from there what kind of supportive housing would you need to lessen the institutional impact mm -hmm. um, there. So I think it'd be a different way of looking at that. Sure. Um, within, um, I think one of the challenging things about building 30% AMI without supportive units is that kind of ongoing operating subsidy throughout the mm -hmm. pro forma. So, um, so often, even when they get state money, there will be a housing support unit within that 30% AMI so that they can have an ongoing subsidy throughout the course of that affordability period. Mm -hmm. And so how do we, I think, Commissioner McDonough, the question is, how do we build 30% AMI without necessarily needing a supportive housing to continue the operating subsidy throughout that period? Mm -hmm. Or how not to let the tail wag the dog, right? I mean, we built a system here that almost forces us to do that because the only way you can continue it is to do the support, right? right? And if we could, we need to just crack that nut and mm -hmm. actually figure out a way, how do we have long-term subsidy to keep it affordable? And that, it's almost, to me, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but it's almost cheaper to be able to find a way to financially support it long-term just to, fit, to keep it affordable and not have to have that supportive component to mm -hmm. it, right? And actually focus that supportive component where it needs to be. Right. I'll just add to, I think so often, um, you know, this investment in the 30% EMI, I think people think the standalone mega unit, 200 units, <laughs> and so, you know, you know, that's certainly one way. However, there's plenty of projects coming through at 50 and 60% area median income that we can use various funds to deepen affordability levels, even if that means 10, 15, 20 units at that deeply affordable, affordable level. Right. Knowing how much investment it takes to maintain that level of affordability, as you all know, for 20 to 30 years. Yep. Um, Mary Jo had a quick Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate call. you bringing up supportive housing. And I think I'm, I, I don't want to get us off far afield, but just in your back of your mind, I think I want to talk about housing with support services just because I was talking to Julie Warren out in Roosevelt and we've got all this housing going on out there. I said, how affordable is it? She goes, well, it's affordable, but these places are going to need child care. They're going to need transit. They're going to need all these things. So I'm hoping as we're, that maybe the county could help or, you know, make sure that there's some child care, you know, in the area or all of that. So I'm just putting that out there that that's just something I'm thinking about and whatever, if you can think about that as you make your remarks. Um, thanks, Commissioner McGuire. I can just say, too, I think that what you just described is exactly how, you know, we can communicate to our city partners how they should be rethinking surface parking areas. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so often these retail centers are converting to um, lifestyle communities mm -hmm. and then yes. they're doing market rate and affordable housing. But then you have all of these, these dead out lots that can be retooled for kind of the supportive land uses mm -hmm. that you just described. Mm -hmm. um, and that was certainly... Um, a thing that rose to the surface in the Urban 3 report and found its way into the vision plan as well. Thank you. So, All right, Max, introduce us to the bench. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, addition to the bench. Okay. Uh, bench. Well, I am pleased to announce our three new community development specialists. Ooh. So within the course of a year, we went from carrying her existing <laughs> team to adding myself to adding three new community Ooh. development specialists. And they each have a focus area to help us accomplish our economic uh, competitiveness and inclusion plan. So um, Jules uh, Atonga um, is, has, is going to be focused on multifamily. So he has 10 years of experience at the City of St. Paul within PED, and he was last a underwriter at Minnesota Housing. So he's really going to help us on that. Um, he has a wealth of knowledge around bonds, around um, the pro forma, around um, and the whole application process in that kind of so I'm really excited. Uh, welcome, Jules. Yeah, welcome. Uh, and then we have Heather Postumas. Heather, Heather um, came to us from last, she was last at Washington County CDA, and she was a senior homeownership specialist. Mm -hmm. And um, she also focused on their land trust project and um, dabbled in their CDBG CV funds, which we are, you'll see next week at the board as well. Uh, welcome. Yeah. And then we have uh, Portia Hill. Uh, 
Portia Jackson. Uh, Portia Jackson also came from a Washington County CDA, so we have two of their. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Washington. Uh, <laughs> also, I wonder why Sorry. Gary <laughs> Creasel was just calling Ortega. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that, but for us. Uh, we're a homeownership specialist as well and uh, focused on um, foreclosure counseling and um, that kind of single family side of things. So that'll be her focus there. Welcome. Mm -hmm. So let's dig into the consortium now. Uh, so we do just have two slides today, and we can kind of you'll see what I just announced here and how our new folks will connect into these. Um, but traditionally, our only way to invest is CDBG in homes. That was just about $1.1 million annually, suburban Ramsey County only. Um, and we had some kind of keynote programs there. First home down payment assistance, our rehab program, which is currently on pause and we are restarting and I'll explain our restarting um, kind of schedule here. Um, and now we have CDBG CV as well, which is CDB Community Development Block Grant Coronavirus. Um, and that needs to be obligated by August 16th. So we are coming to the board with our obligation ideas. And I think this is a great idea of how we can connect to what Mary, uh, Commissioner McGuire just said in um, about kind of supportive services in our suburban Ramsey County area. Um, the, and then we will build into our HRA levy in the future as that connects to the economic competitiveness inclusion plan and then ARP as well. Um, so as we talk about, first we'll talk about our single family programs. And so, that connects both to the goal of preserving our affordable housing stock as well as wealth creation. Um, so our critical repair pilot, which will be coming to the board in our CDBG CV, is a grant program, which is different than our rehab loan program. It's going to be a small for those kind of, I need to have this repaired now so that my home does not get condemned. And that will be available in suburban Ramsey County, both for single family homes and manufactured homes. Mm -hmm. And so that's really a pilot to see how it works with manufactured homes mm -hmm. and provide that kind of um, step into someone who might be more uncomfortable with a loan program. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to be up to $5,000 there. Mm -hmm. um, that RFP actually closes August 6th, so on Friday. Um, and we will mm -hmm. be um, kind of obligating the idea, and then we'll um, be kind of coming back to you with who, which providers will be selected there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we, our rehab program was formerly run by the city of St. Paul and before that by Gimmick, and that has been uh, paused due to Gimmick stepping away from that and closing actually in the city of St. Paul stepping away from that as well. Um, and we'll be launching that RFP August 13th. So that's another opportunity for this kind of single family home preservation and wealth creation uh, programs. And of course our first home uh, program continues there. Um, Moving into multifamily, um, we traditionally just invest home funding really in this area. And so this year's home funding projects, uh, we have Amber Union, which uh, construction starts August 16th up on Larpenter and Snelling in the former um, Union Hall on the corner there. Um, historic Preservation Tax Credit Project with a little bit of home funding. Uh, we have the uh, harbor at Twin Lakes in the Roseville Twin Lakes District, 277 <laughs> units of senior housing. Oh at 50% AMI, um, so that's a huge project. And then uh, a, we obligated a small amount of home funding to a Maplewood project, um, Gladstone Village, um, which would be uh, constructed by JB, JB Vang Partners, and they are currently in the Minnesota Housing RFP to see how they do in there. Um, so we would be we kind of were first in in that sense to help them gain um, up their state score there. Um, we also. Um, over the last course of the last year, have obligated general obligation bonds to 30% AMI projects, both in the city of St. Paul. One was a preservation project, St. Paul Residence, mm -hmm. and the other was the um, common bond senior project in the Highland Bridge area. Mm -hmm. development. And then conduit revenue bonds, this is kind of a newer area. And so um, this will be something that we will be exploring. Is this something that we should do every year, or every other year? Is What's our debt capacity here? Um, so the, those conversations will continue. But um, that was our Wilder Square project through Common Pond, and that mm -hmm. giant preservation project as well. Um, and so, really, we will continue to build out uh, based off of the economic vision plan in that area as well. Uh, one of those uh, project ideas is the rental rehab area, and I think this connects to our as we build relationships with landlords. And so, as housing stability needs to build relationships with landlords, so do we. 
And so one of the first steps is to gain a better understanding of kind of the municipal on the municipal level, uh, who does licensing, who does inspections, who does code enforcement, what are their relationships with landlords, how can we kind of come in with investment to help preserve those units as well and maybe help those landlords um, up there, um, for lack of a better term, their score, right, mm -hmm. um, in, in the eyes of the inspectors. So just to piggyback yeah. on that too, um, Ling mentioned the kind of green construction and green infrastructure, and that's something that that Ling and I have been talking about in particular because so often many of our multifamily properties are in uh, disrepair and they're unable to, for example, install a solar panel because of the condition of their roof. Mm -hmm. And so, is there a way that we can partner together with Workforce Solutions to create kind of a solar installation program mm -hmm. that also reduces the housing affordability piece yep. of the housing? Opportunities. Trish, to go ahead. Yeah, on that note, the Met Council is currently doing that same thing here in Ramsey County and across the city of St. Paul is installing solar roofs with landlords of, I think, four plexes is kind of their three plexes or four plexes. So we're not going to duplicate, but we'll collaborate and mm -hmm. expand, right? I just yeah. want to make sure that we're all know who's doing what. And yeah. We've, we've begun conversations with them it's specifically cool. to kind of amplify that. Excellent. Great. Yay. And then the, one of the <coughs> traditional uses of CDBG is you can usually use 15% of your normal CDBG for public services. Um, CDBG CV, that cap was lifted, and so that's a really good way to continue on um, kind of the work that was done uh, through the CARES Act and um, expand kind of what we learned in those CARES Act evaluations as well. And so um, I'll go through a couple of our both CDBG and CDBG CV. Um, potential CDBG CV funded um, ideas here. Um, one would be to um, continue funding of the emergency hotel program for families, um, which is in our summer months. So we already have our school year funded, but um, we continue during COVID the summer months. And so allowing, using CDBG CV funding to continue that. Um, another CDBG CV um, proposal will be uh, legal services. So putting about $200,000 that's what uh, is proposed uh, towards legal services, um, which will kind of connect back to the eviction prevention. So um, with that, through Volunteer uh, Lawyers Network, uh, Smurls and Housing Justice Center, every single uh, renter in um, suburban Ramsey County who needs legal representation should be able to have that through that network and what we're funding there. So that's a really big part of kind of matching that with the Rent Help MM okay. and our other work in ERA as well. So I think that'll be a key kind of Connection point. And maybe I wanted to jump in. Sorry, Max, and you might get on the on the beyond backgrounds, but on that legal services, I mean, some of the big barriers are the past convictions, right? And so many people just don't understand the expungement process. It's not maybe as complicated as they think, especially if the time has gone by. And that could be a big return on for us is investing some of these legal service dollars into helping folks navigate the expungement process mm -hmm. because that that just comes up all the time on the, mm -hmm. and i see yeah. shaking of heads trista yeah. has got her finger up on that one too but yeah um housing justice center is a major partner for expungement mm -hmm. and um, through funding them that will be part of that scope of services they just Good. need to be a low to moderate income resident live in suburban ramsey county and have a um, show a impact from COVID-19. Yep. Thank you. Trista, go ahead. Yeah, I just have a question. You know, when um, the city of St. Paul passed a resolution to allow us to do the HRA levy and a scope of work to operate, can we use CDBG then in that it only HRA levy funds? Okay. Um, two projects. Uh, actually, one more CDBG proposal will be uh, mortgage assistance. So right now there is no mortgage, direct mortgage assistance dollars kind of in the market from government assistance. The state is coming in, but it probably won't be ready until the end of 2021. So we want to provide a little bit of money to fill that gap as, we, um, as we're starting to hear about people starting to struggle through forbearance and um, the next steps after that as well. Um, so we are in the, um, that RFP closed about two weeks ago and we are in communication, uh, communication about uh, with those partners who applied about what's the best way to actually split that up. And so um, hopefully we'll be able to um, provide that provider to the board next week as well. And Victoria's got a question. And, and 
I remember when we were talking about the different pools of funds and how they can leverage each other because even though something can't use the CDBG funds, mm -hmm. that what what they would have been used on that COVID funds can be used for. So it still um, provides the additional support allowing that to happen depending on where it fits, correct? So you can put you can cobble the things together and what fits where. Um, so that your pot is a little bit larger, even though some of it is more restricted on what it can be used on. Yeah, and then there's the environmental response fund too, which yeah. um, can help leverage uh, various types of housing. Um, and so, but I think your your point is relevant. Where as you start to put together what is the kind of toolkit, you have the restrictions that come with traditional CDBG, and then you've got CDBG CV, which we need to demonstrate kind of closer um, degree of kind of. COVID-19 mitigation prevention or some you know aspect there. But then you're going to have the flexibility that comes with the HRA levy. And then also um, you know the, the ARC fund and, and the guidance that comes along with that. And so to your point, if there's a project that comes in, theoretically there should be a variety of sources that can fund it. Okay, continue. Um, just the two things that we continually fund through CDBG are beyond background. So that relates to what Commissioner McDonald was talking about uh, previously and kind of the, or maybe it was in the last board workshop on uh, Keith's board workshop. Sorry, I was just yeah. listening to that one before this one, so I was up to date on that. Um, yeah, that's focused on um, that relationship with landlords. And um, it's a small program, just it's only seven households or so. Uh, so that's an opportunity to expand in the future, I think. Um, Homeline tenant hotline as well as kind of that eviction prevention strategy. Okay, let's dig in. We've already started this conversation, uh, yeah. but let's dig in even further here. So we know that Ramsey County needs over 15,000 units of 30% AMI units, um, as described in the Economic Competitiveness and Inclusion Plan. So I just pulled up our new uh, AMI numbers. So if you were 30% AMI in our region, you'd be making $22,000 or less. If you're one person, if you're a family of four, you'd be making $31,450 or less. So you can imagine in this apartment market, in this uh, housing market, the extreme difficulty finding any uh, unit that would uh, not cost burden you, or you would even be able to even walk in and afford it all. Um, and so I think that clearly demonstrates what we need. And those, um, and so we know we don't just need permanent supportive but we also need that just broader 30% AMI. And so one of those areas where we've identified where permanent supportive is actually not a good fit um, are the folks who live in the Capitol Ridge Hotel system uh, in the hotel shelter. They are senior citizens mostly. Mm -hmm. They um, are on social security income. You wouldn't want to go into that with a housing support because they would that would be a large portion of your client obligation. So um, you might lose 50% of your income right there on client obligation to live in supportive housing. And so this, that would be a population that would fit really well into just 30% AMI with no type of other support services. Um, and so that's one example, I think, uh, that elucidates that kind of need for just 30% AMI as well. Uh, so we are diving into a, uh, a work group, basically, with the City of St. Paul. So. Um, how do we align all of our funding sources, um, whether, whether that's um, HRA, or CDBG, CDBG, CV, or home, um, to focus on this need? Because um, they know that they need 11, they've identified that they need 11,000 within the city of St. Paul itself. So, um, so here we have this really big need. And so we um, want to focus on two strategies. One would be investing in traditional new construction. Um, where we are investing as a funder into kind of that long-term pro forma for a project that's not built yet. The other kind of more creative option would be to, um, uh, pr with nonprofit partners, pursue, uh, pursue acquisition or some sort of um, conversion as well. And so both the city and county are interested in that conversation. City staff and county staff are interested in that conversation. Um, as we continue, yeah. Just on that. Yeah, Mary Jo, go ahead. You know, just because you mentioned the city of St. Paul and just, um, we know we, we know we have the suburbs, and so just to talk about what you might be doing in the suburbs, and just as an awareness for all of us, I'm just hearing too many comments on the suburbs because I know we all care about the whole county, but there sometimes when they hear conversations like this, they say, "What are you doing for the suburbs?" And we know we're doing stuff for the suburbs, but just when we're talking about things, if we could try to be conscious of 
just mentioning that we have suburbs out there too. <laughs> but before so, you answer that, yeah. I'm going to combine my question with Mary Jo. Yeah. We, we're saying 15,000 of 30%, St. Paul's saying 11. So that would mean 4,000 in the suburbs. So let's talk about that in that yeah, context, it right? Yeah, it seems yeah. like St. Paul's taken on a really large responsibility for this 15,000. And so I think yeah. that's why this, is important, this conversation is yeah, important, I right? I agree. I think, I think those are worthy comments. I also, I, I think, you know, the county manager has Said this as well. There need to be housing options in every corner of our community, yes. Mm -hmm. and so um, to the degree that we can help every community reach their goals, um, we're going to absolutely aim to do that. And so I think it's just a matter of, uh, to Commissioner uh, Reinhardt's earlier point about, you know, the CDBG homes, CDBG CV that is restricted to the suburbs, and trying to figure out which pot of money essentially yeah. goes to advance what. But I can share with you, Commissioner McGuire, that we have um, we typically had a, a quarterly economic development summit cadence. And now we have monthly economic development summits with all of our city partners. And I would say there's probably more suburban kind of uh, mm -hmm. participation in the city of St. Paul in this regard um, that can meet monthly to talk about how we build out programming, specifically with HRA Levy in mind, but certainly with our allocations as well. And we have had um, several communities reach out to us with particular projects in the pipeline to say, did you do the our allocation, we'd be interested. And so we are having those conversations countywide. And anything that, you know, is potentially created in partnership with City of St. Paul, who, as we know, received a very sizable sum of our allocation, um, can be scaled countywide, absolutely. And, and I love, thank you, thank you. I know this is happening, and I always say that it's happening. And so as much as I can be the, the communicator for that out there, that's good. So it's good to know all this, because I just want to keep reminding them that we are doing all these things. Right. And I just want to point out the obvious, which is we have a significant number of <laughs> projects we are attempting to move forward in suburban communities yes, that know. would have a relatively <laughs> large <laughs> aspect of affordable housing. And that actually, I mean, but that yes. does matter yes, to yes, this yes. conversation. Yes. No, no, I appreciate that. I, I said, I know I'll we're doing all this. I just want to make sure we're, that we're always, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We appreciate uh, it. Do <laughs> you have a comment or a question? <laughs> All right. As we segue, I think you can you can see the value of Max in this role, being able to speak, you know, both from the kind of service side and housing stability side, and then also understanding the housing development piece. So I just want to express, you know, our enthusiasm around Max in Indeed. this space and, and it's going to propel forward faster. Um, so. Mm -hmm. All right. Tony, did you have a question or were you just no, no, just thumbs okay. up? <laughs> Thank you. Thumbs up, yeah. all right. All right. Is that your phone? Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> I just go back in his way. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't like this. All right. Um, so, good afternoon again. Um, so, just last week we were in the same room, so I just wanted to is kind of our part of the presentation here to say that some of what you'll see in here today is kind of what we you know also mentioned last week um so we'll speak from a high level surface but certainly be able to some of the, some of those questions and follow-ups uh with me today um you know as you looked at you know kind of how we're working collaboratively with one another um specifically in our service team um and you know you look at max and kind of the role that he's had and that ability to be able to go back and forth and talk to different areas i think is still the brilliance of how we you know how this was set up in the first place for the service team um us being together as three departments that's working very closely with other within our core in order to try to turn this you know around uh specifically in the areas of working workforce solution and cd i mean so those are those are really unique spaces and obviously you know under Joanna service team with us being our brother and sister departments here I believe is really where we're going to be able to make some strides so a bunch of the work that we have to do from a housing stability standpoint is still yet to come but we are making those plans and putting our you know getting our feet where, uh, wet if you will and I think that we are safe to say that we're in housing stability we're building a plane as we're already flying so you know much of that is um there but certainly to be able to uh be here and lean on you know uh, my peers um you know obviously from building a new department as well as trying to maintain some of the things that we've done with our imc um it's just kind of bridging all those together and being able to lean on one another it's it's 
is really helpful, I think, as we move this work forward. Um, I wanted to start off a little bit um, with just introducing um, Leanna Mott for, you know, um, who came to us as well, um, who had been in this work uh, for housing stability, and she is our housing stability planning manager. And much of what we talked about last week is really her jumping in and being able to get into the weeds around how we, you know, move the work forward, um, working, her working very close with Max and his transition away and her transition in has been a seamless work just because, you know, her ability to get in. So I want to take a moment just to introduce her um, as the planning manager. Welcome. And with that, I'll go ahead and segue to her to go ahead and jump into um, the presentation. So hopefully two years from now, we'll be able to give an awesome presentation and website like we saw today. <laughs> We're just getting started. <laughs> um, so with the graphic kind of revisiting, um, where does the supply and the demand meet? That is the, the, the main charge right now as we build the housing mobility department. So working on the demand side, like what do the clients need, what do our partners who provide the services need, and what do landlords need in order to really build the infrastructure that's needed. Um, so we start with a comprehensive prevention plan. Right now we have SHPAP grants, but really it was just that, grant management. So how do we have a front door that really looks at the comprehensive goals around prevention and building strategies and maybe attracting more funds around that? And then we look at who's unsheltered. We currently have support for people who are in uh, outreach, as well as our day services and night services and other support services. But again, they were maybe um, not as glued together as they should be. And so there's a lot of opportunity with this department to really look at our contracts and to look at what our strategies are and how we're really addressing the unsheltered needs and learning from the hotel projects, for example, the hotels were able to support couples. We know a lot of people stay in encampments because they want to stay together as couples and the shelters don't really meet that need. So how are we going to take those learnings and really support that through the power that we have through some of our contracts? And then looking at shelters, um, where are we funding the shelters? We haven't, we don't have a shelter planner. I really hope someday that we do. But um, right now I'll take a look at that and just kind of examining where do we fund shelters how and is it an equitable process? And then that leads to where we meet is that supportive housing piece from our end. That is, what are we doing to work with the landlords? What are we doing interdepartmentally to work amongst social services, veteran services, CEB, workforce solutions, to make sure that when people are in housing, they're not coming back into a recurring housing program, a homelessness program, which we know is a problem. And then um, really specifically addressing, people have told us over and over and over, through the hotel program and other surveys that they want employment opportunities that we just have never really gotten to it because we have been so focused on the emergency response. So thinking proactively on how we build in that employment so that it can become a step away from just supportive housing to more permanent housing. And so what we, we have is in front of us is that 18 individuals came out of FASD and Health and Wellness Admin and we came into the Housing Stability Department along with the hire of Keith and a few others. So we're small, um, but we do have a lot of contracts. And so you don't always see that on the org chart, right? Because we have so many millions of dollars obligated in contracts. So this will be an opportunity to really focus through where the spending is going and how we can build resources around it. So what we've done is Keith and I kind of mapped out what do we want out of this department? And so we have this graphic, and I'm sure it'll change, but it's a starting point. Um, we want to make sure that people have a central place to gain their information. So reception, websites, media, social media. What is all the information around housing and homeless stability? What are the resources? There really is not one go-to place in the county for that right now. So we'll be focusing on that, starting with some strategic sessions by the end of this year to really find out from our partners what they would like to know when they call our office when we do open that office. Um, <laughs> there's a little chuckle there. <laughs> and then um, really thinking about sharing power. We do have a lot of power. It might not be recognized previously before the department because it was scattered, but really through the contracts relationships, that power is there. And so 
when we are charged with equity and shared power, thinking through then how are we approaching the solutions? And so that also ties into our community solutions framework. Um, so together, I, I look at diversion and navigation as our walk along. Um, we're not going to call our individuals navigators, but they will do navigation services. They'll be called housing specialists. We hope to be able to hire more over the years. Right now, we have a few. And these individuals really help address the barriers, um, you know, expungement, connecting people with resources, finding out um, a lot of times it's missing documentation. What are we doing to build in repositories and keeping people's uh, information safe for them so they're not constantly looking for their social security card, their ID, um, helping people to understand what benefits are available to them. And so when we were in the hotel program, we, we realized that only 5% of people reported last week had access to medical assistance. That's not right. Like, so what are we going to do better about that? And then through 77% of people um, gained access or were reinstated to benefits. So clearly there's a disconnect. And we want to become those subject matter experts who really know what it takes to walk through and gain access to housing while you're on your wait list with, you know, keys or paws, um, and then be available and be ready to take housing. And then what's been sorely missing and really exciting is the supportive housing piece, which is what are we doing once people are in housing? How do we work with landlords, building a landlord toolkit? Um, first, we want to hear from the landlords. That's part of our EAC work that we're doing, Equity Action Circle, um, to find out what do they want to know? What do they know or don't they know about their rights? Partnering with the city, we don't want to take the city's role on that, but really partnering and building some understanding and partnership with CED and hopefully partnering with uh, Workforce Solutions on the supportive services related to employment. And then finally, just real commitment to uh, working as partners. This is not anything we can be close to doing on our own. This is all about the partners in the community who are doing it, who are the experts, um, Keith likes to talk about that highway, so helping build and strengthen those on-ramps and those off-ramps <laughs> so that we are that, that backbone, that highway that really supports our partners and emerging new partners who want to come into the city. Yeah, one thing I'll add there, uh, you know, we're going to say, yes, the highway to housing. <laughs> so, um, but, but one of the things that we wanted to do, and we feel like we can make some strides in, we believe that um, coming out of the you know, this pandemic, that there are some landlords who are um, interested in getting out of the landlord business. And we want to, you know, take advantage of pulling them in and doing some engagement work, of which we have secured funds to do some of that work, just to try to find out. I, I believe it's an opportunity for us, uh, us to make some strides. Where there were landlords per, perhaps before pre-pandemic who were not maybe interested in working with government um, along the continuum. And now I believe that there's opportunity for us to bring them back to the table so they can know that, you know, they too um, can have support, you know, along the way. And so we're hoping to make some strides there too. So, um, you know, that's some work I think that, you know, we can do and I want to be able to take advantage of that. Um, a couple of things as we uh, move along the slides. Um, some strategic planning sessions uh, with individuals that live experiences and internally uh, community-based partners. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about that last week, but we want to really to make sure that, you know, our planning sessions involve, you know, everyone. Uh, those with lived experiences, we do want to hear from them as well. Uh, we don't want this to be a one directional, um, you know, where we talk at someone or we solve someone's problems without hearing um, what works for them. And so we want to make sure that those are individuals that are at the table. Um, when we look at the other bullets, uh, we also talked about evaluate learnings from our emergency hotel shelter. Uh, Leanne spoke a little bit about that as well. Um, and then our third bullet, um, when we talk about our um, equity action circle recommendations, um, this is where we want to say some of those non-traditional vendors that we haven't used, or maybe they've slipped through the cracks, or maybe they're smaller vendors than some of those entrepreneurs that you know Ling and, and, and Carrie spoke about. Being, how do we get them to the table and how do we make sure that it's a system that's inclusive where they're not always left, you know, maybe to the side? And I think that there's room for improvement for us as a county to be able to work with those individuals, specifically some of those of uh, communities of color, where we can have opportunities for those who are using the services to stay within communities and also build that community and keep those individuals connected to, you know, religious 
you know, uh, supports, as well as family supports, and as well um, as close to their uh, economical employment, you know, opportunities that are there for them. Um, and we also want to do some work to um, bring those individuals to the table, specifically the departmental um, uh, departments that, you know, we wanted to do this uh, interdepartment housing council. We wanted to bring that back so we could make sure that along that highway that we speak about, um, that all of our departments are there, specifically those who are in this work. And there are so many departments that touch the homeless community and those who are struggling to find housing that we shouldn't have to go through different doors to get services for Ramsey County. To me, we want to make a, uh, it's important to make a one entrance, no matter if it comes through housing stability, CED, or workforce solutions, that if someone finds that, hey, housing is an issue that we have a way to connect them without taking them out that door and bringing them to another, you know. So that's some of the things in the work that we believe is ongoing. And obviously, we'll be working very closely with our partners to be able to get them to the table and have those commitments there for our folks that are using the services. As we continue on, um, you know, we have a couple other bullets here. Um, and we increased the individual income and assets. Um, through our continuum of care, we are measured by our HUD score. And these are measures that we have, you know, um, we've just been mediocre in our approach. And I think that now with housing stability, we can be more focused on being able to increase our HUD scores because to be honest with you, we've left money on the table where we have had reductions in the fundings that we've gotten. Um, we want to be able to increase that and by giving it, you know, some attention and making sure that we're doing it well. And those are some things that we want to do in order to increase our scores. And uh, Ramsey County has lost uh, funds and other counties have increased funds. And so we feel like we can do a better job of that and how the stability will be focused on increasing those scores. Um, <clears throat> one of the ways that we want to be able to, um, you know, uh, increase our service delivery is, uh, you know, we talk about SPOC and getting back to making sure that we look, we look at our St. Paul Opportunity Center as a service center and expand maybe, you know, being able to help those individually as well as families and children and so we want to be able to have this more of a service center type approach than what it was before. And it's kind of focused on single, you know, single um, adults. So we want to try to expand that. And, and, and we believe we can do that and we can do it better if we have those individuals at the table offering those services. Um, we wanted to also um, talk about our, you know, um, not leaving money on the table and increasing those funding opportunities. We believe that we could do that as well by getting our uh, community vendors um, those in the community to participate in our COC and our Heading Home Ramsey, that's another way that we want to enhance our abilities to be able to increase our HUD scores. Uh, so some of the goals we have in order to do that as we look at what, what are we doing with the Interdepartmental Housing Council, um, we want to restart in October of 2021. So we'll be um, in the work of pulling all of the different uh, department heads together in order to make some commitments and being able to have those and start getting those on a more frequent calendar. So we can start talking about how those services are uh, delivered from each department and have that centralized area that can make sure that those coordinated services are within the way that we want to do it, our Ramsey way of making sure that those services are out there. Um, and we want to, you know, co-hosted by CEB and HSD. So, um, so we had, you know, that kind of concludes our, um, presentation, but wanted to just make sure that we um, highlight again that this work is not done alone. And although we talk about what we control as Ramsey County, we're getting everyone at the table, there's a big investment that's needed with our community. And we hope that our community partners will be able to, um, to add their, you know, participate with what we're putting together at St. Paul Opportunity Center. They'd be on the road on that continuum that we talked about and be able to have also folks at the table who can tell us how to navigate community resources as well. So we know that there's a, a need to have those specialists for Ramsey County services, but we also know that we need the help of someone in the community to make sure that we tie all those pieces together so we have a holistic approach to approaching this work.
Okay, back up. Ryan. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just, um, these are always interesting because I get to kind of receive them through a different way than when it's a regular workshop, too. Mm -hmm. So my one comment would be, and I, I wrote this one to Joanna, Corrections had originally been a part of the St. Paul Opportunity Center pieces and stuff. And we, I, I'm not saying we should or shouldn't, mm -hmm. but I think we had landed where some of the POs may have some value there. And when we had toured, actually, I was a part of it. I just wanted to flag for both the Interdepartmental mm -hmm. Council and for SPOC, consideration of having corrections be a part of the lens of being asked. Then my last question actually kind of goes to you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> The one piece not in here is the mapping of how the COC overlays with this work. And I need to I need to say, like, as it's all changed there a lot, that remains a little unclear to me. And I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or how we do that. But going forward, from where I sit, that would be helpful because everyone's always calling me and saying, how does this all fit? And um, that's one step we didn't talk about today. I just like it. No, I think that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. And I probably should talk about going on in the future. I mean, there's a couple things. One is Keith talked about the HUD money, and I mean that's our number one priority, right? Working together at the continuum. That's on every agenda item that we have. Um, but then in the same vein, um, actually next week or this week, but tomorrow, um, we're doing a brief presentation to the city council. They asked us because of this reconfiguration of the continuum of care and what that means, and they have less connection and less understanding of what's been going on on that other than council member Nakers rep on that um, you know but other than that it's really been out of the mayor's office where most of that works occurred through uh, deputy mayor Tincher. so we're doing a brief presentation tomorrow kind of where we were where we're at and where we want to go and how does this and so you know I think not too far off in the future we probably need to bring back to this board, kind of the work. I mean, Lynn called out her excitement about being on there, but I can tell you <laughs> almost every member has, you know, reached out to me and said, thank God Ling's here. I mean, this work that we've done there has really kind of moved it from the usual suspects of kind of banging their heads against the wall, doing the same thing and expecting different results to this new opportunity to actually trying and moving us forward in, in different ways. So I think the timing here and I can work with Chair Carter, you know, what that might look like. But I think um, having a, a bigger picture a little, a opportunity to do a little deeper dive on what's happened in this past year on the continuum of care and connections. He's on our executive committees on every single, you know, membership full board meeting, but, you know, uh, Deputy Mayor Titcher is the vice chair. We have an executive committee meeting, really regular, keeps a part of that. And uh, I think he'll be a part of the presentation to the city council tomorrow. Um, so, yeah, a lot of good stuff happening. Okay. And we'll Thank add you. it. Um, good I'll question. Also add, Ryan, I think that is the goal of housing stability to align the work with sort of the things that are coming out of housing stability. We won't. We don't want to run a different department that's not aligned with, you know, where the work is. Mm -hmm. So, although some things will be a, a, a differ slightly because we have to have some barriers between what, uh, you know, our heading home Ramsey as well as how the stability is doing, we want to make sure that the work aligns. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Thank you. I would say there's a, an interesting parallel piece that maybe we can talk about with the workforce board and how work, our department runs mm -hmm. and maybe. Kind of a, a good parallel of, of operations yeah. and alignment. So not seeing hands up from my colleagues, and I know a few had a lay, but the, you know, that doesn't mean that they're not interested in this. I got two things I want to throw out real quick here in the last couple of minutes here before we end. One kind of on that, you know, lessons learned, right? But then also, how are we, we adjusting, right? You mentioned the couples issue. You know, we always knew pets was kind of this piece, but then how do we accommodate, you know, for you know, we also recognize that, you know, for gay and lesbian, and we've done that. We've learned, right? How do we make sure we have the right housing for people on their terms and what they need? You know, what? two things that have, I think have always been a big issue here is, you know, our traditional model of shelter, that Catholic Charities model of shelter is show up at 7 o'clock, you, you get a match, get a spot, leave at 6 a.m. or 5 a.m. We might give you a breakfast, we might not. And then you got to kind of sort out through the rest of the day. But more than that, we're trying to track them down, right, to get them connected to services. You know, the attempt to, for us to establish at the St. Paul Opportunity Center with our folks right there in-house was an attempt to kind of make that. But, you know, at what point do we actually, you know, the Bethesda model where 
they get a spot, right? I mean, they don't have to leave during the day. They've got a spot where they can come back to. We don't have these issues, you know, listening house trying to do their roles or these day providers trying to do their roles or libraries that aren't necessarily, you know, drop-in centers for or unsheltered, but they're, they have to figure out how to do that because we don't provide shelter in a way that meets the need. So I throw that out there, not that we have control, but what is our convening power here as we've got this team pulled together about how do, what do we learn here to be able to meet the needs better? And actually, you know, it, that Bethesda model where they don't leave, we don't have to chase them down, right? We've got them right there. How do we continue to provide services and get them connected to those services? Big thing, but I just throw that out as our convening power What's our role in that? And looking forward on those bigger changes. And now I'm gonna to go to the other end of the continuum because I got everybody here at this table and Tris is very familiar with this issue, right? We did a big public works project on Maryland and Payne, big deal, moved a lot of stuff. We took a half a block. It baffles me. I have no idea why we signed an agreement and we gave city the development authority to dispose of that project. Mm -hmm. It just totally baffles me. Mm -hmm. We've got my VAC, the Veterans Association, highly interested coming to the table with money to provide a new opportunity of how we can meet some of the needs of housing here in a, a, a concentrated area of small yard homes yeah. that provide services and we are nothing but bumping up against issues i just got asked the other day to use my political you know title of convening to bring people together to get this project unstuck and, you know, Max, I know you've been a part of it. I know there's been thoughts of going back to the city and amending the agreement and pulling that authority back to us to figure out so that we have the authority to actually move forward on the development. We can't lose this opportunity when we got, you know, the Minnesota Veterans Association coming to the table with money. We just talked about the 30% affordability with supports, without supports. We've got, you know, reputable, trusted partners in the community we own the land and we're like stuck. And I don't, you know, I, I can do that. I can be the convener. I can pull. My hope is what, what are our options to get the sun stuck? Where are we stuck with the city? Where are we actually stuck? Mm -hmm. And how can we get this project unstuck? To, I mean, the community is for this. Mm -hmm. Community had presentations six years ago about a tiny home development before <laughs> You know, tiny homes was even, and they were all over it. The District 5 Council was all over it. So we've got things aligned here, but it seems like it's just stuck somewhere. So help me out. How do we get this unstuck and get this project going? Well, I'll just add, too, that I, in conversations with City of St. Paul, this, is, this opportunity is certainly in alignment with their goals as well. So, I, you know, there's, there's goal alignment, but I don't know if you're able to share the more recent meeting you've had with them. Yep, so the most recent meeting is we discovered that within the public works agreement, uh, as Commissioner McDonough said, that the uh, development authority was passed on to the city of St. Paul. Uh, this has not been on the city of St. Paul's radar, so they haven't been doing anything with it. Um, and so I imagine that they would be willing to shift that back to us. And um, uh, our director of public works said that kind of uh, contract amendment is not unusual. Um, to kind of adjust something with an amendment. Um, so that is a conversation that needs to happen next is, one, is the city gonna transfer that kind of back, are they okay with transferring us back to that and then moving through the kind of legal aspects of the contract? And then I guess that begs the next question though, because it's just not about the development authority, it's about some zoning issues. So you, you feel pretty confident we're in a line with their goals. Um, you know, we. Let's keep this simple, right? Let's keep it right, but let's keep it simple and figure out a way to get this thing moving and not keep causing our, you know, I don't know if that's just, it's more than just getting it back to our authority, especially if they're aligned with the goals. Because what I'm here, the feedback I'm hearing from MyVac is extreme frustration. They're moving forward with projects in Minneapolis and they're just got, I mean, everybody's bending over backwards to help them get their stuff going. And they feel like in this project is like everybody's putting up barriers. Mm -hmm. To get slow them down or stop this project. And then I think a second broader discussion would be with these types of county owned kind of marginal parcels, whether because this is currently designated as right away and it's not technically a parcel yet, so we'd have to kind of redefine it as a parcel. Um, do we how do we want to solicit these? Um, do we want to go as someone approaches us, like in this example, or do we want to have a broader kind of more public 
uh, RFP for these type of marginal uh, properties. Okay. Last week at the board, we moved a parcel similar to this, mm -hmm. uh, 694 in Rice, and we didn't have any other conversation, and it just came right to a RBA. And so to me, it seems like we've got a mismatch of what we're doing with different county properties, because if that wasn't a parcel either, and it was right away. But we just went right to an RBA last week, and we all approved it. Yeah. So it seems to me like, you know, we've got a standard set there. And, and Commissioner, I think this is absolutely um, Kind of the great kind of foundation as to why this kind of equitable development framework um, is needed and that's kind of internally the framework for that is being created right now um, so that it will help with the disposition of land or acquisition of land um, so that there is a consistent practice um, I think more needs to be worked through with the city of st paul clearly and so commissioner McDonough, i can i can commit mm -hmm. to convening ensuring that all the parties get into a room and say okay what is the next step in terms of the kind of goal alignment, I think City of St. Paul certainly wants to advance housing in this way. Um, you know, the land, there could be land use complexities that we're not aware of at this time. So just wanted to So, Carrie, thank you for that, because my preference is, I mean, I, I, you know, part of this is, is I don't want to have to be the convener. I can do that, you know, but that, that shouldn't be my role, right? And, and I appreciate you offering you know, my role is to bring it to you guys that there's some, I'm hearing from the community there's some issues. We need to bring everybody to the table and not have this kind of, you know, trail of things going on. So I appreciate your willingness to be able to do that and then, you know, report back to us about how that's moving forward. Ryan, did you I would just comment on this one? Yeah, because we can get lost in both the big and the small as we go. Let's put together a list of the things that we think we need to work through. Let's get a checklist and let's grind through it. And through that, we'll learn things that help us shape some of the broader questions, right? The framework and Max's questions. And in the meantime, let's just like, for me, what I struggle with now as I listen to this is like, there's clearly five things that need to happen, but it might be seven or it might be four or it might be nine. And so it's like, let's put them down. Let's agree with St. Paul on what they are. And then we can be really good at executing against that. I think we wait for them to help us there. It might mm -hmm. take a while. Mm -hmm. So I, what I would commit back to is like, we'll get a list of what the items are. So we can start to really move it and and kind of grind through that piece of it. Can I push you just a little farther sure. on that? So if you know, I think we need to figure out early on. Are we thinking we are, this is a worthy project that we want to work with my back on and just move forward that way, or are we thinking we need to do a bigger RFP type thing? Who else is interested? Because if we think this project's pretty limited, the opportunities on this site are pretty limited in scope, and they are, and that the partnership with MyVac is probably the partnership we want to explore. And then we need to maybe have them a part of the conversation here. So just not Ramsey St. Paul, but them about what are those barriers or solutions at some point, at least uh, maybe not that first meeting, but you know, Max, your question is really important and Trista, I think you, you called out some. I think we need to decide early on, is this the group that we want to explore to its maximum potential for this opportunity, or are we setting this up for an RP and seeing what else is out there? And Commissioner, I'll just, just kind of a final thing as we wrap up here. I don't want to necessarily slow this particular opportunity down. However, I do think that there are other parcels yes. out there that okay. we could probably do kind of a larger request for proposal across maybe a variety of sites, scattered sites like this. Yep. Um, that yield, um, you know, interesting concepts yeah. to review what works that's where, uh, so that we're not maybe doing a one-off approach. Yeah. Although we do pilot projects all the time, yeah. and I would hate for us to wait for perfection to get in the way of something really good. We'll come, yeah, and, give us a shot. We'll yeah. come back with something. Mm -hmm. I think there's an argument to be made that you might actually want to work with a, someone who's ready, willing, and has funding, if that's right. in fact true, right. Right? right? Do it, learn what you want, and then exactly. RFP the rest. And if the board is comfortable, you know, authorizing us to be able to work in that way as we go forward, and dealing with whatever question that might bring up. I mean, under the charter, there are times when we can do that, particularly with property discharge. So mm -hmm. it's not in, inconsistent with the way that we are set up to run. So Perfect. I agree with that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, everybody. I, yeah. I mean, to throw this on anybody, but, you know, these things are out there. And every, I look around the table, it's like, this, every, I need to talk to all of you, and I'd rather than make one phone call. And then there's other opportunities out there, right? And let's think about that as we're moving Gary or Joanna, you got an amazing team here doing some amazing collaborative yeah. work. I oh. think you know, 
been for us to see that feedback. And that bench is a, a pretty neat bench here, Carrie. You guys are doing well. Good job. Thank you. We appreciate all of your support. Thank you yep. very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your time. We're adjourned. The president just reinstated the eviction moratorium. Uh-huh. Wow. Really? Are you kidding? Oh, yeah. Really? You were way down the road.